One thing I learned, uh, a fun exercise, right, I, I used to do often was uh, uh, calendar stalking, right? And this is something that uh, I learned also at Google. Like somebody, I, I forgot actually who it was. It was, uh, I think it was a product manager I worked with. And uh, she told me that, uh, I mean, Hardik, like you would actually learn more about what's happening in the organization if you just talk to people's calendars. If you had a chance to do something very different, something very different in your life, okay, and you cannot tell me the startup answer. Sure. Uh, what would you do? I'll make uh, leather wallets. An academy as a company has gone through two layoffs now. And you as a leader have a massive role to play in terms of, let's say, managing the team's motivations, how the culture is, how the environment during that time is super stressful. What was that journey like for you? I'll tell you, it's a little bit Hi everyone, welcome to the first season of Behind the Screens. Today I have with me Hardik Pandya, a famous cricketer, a sorry, designer. Um, he's, been, he's been a designer since the last 10 years, now a design leader. He's worked in companies, currently he's working at an academy where he's leading all design efforts there. Uh, he's worked in companies like Google, InstaMojo, OLX in his past. Uh, today I'm going to ask him some very tough questions probably. Hopefully I'm going to ask him something that's going to really get the most out of him. So firstly, thanks Hardik for joining in. Really happy to have you. Are you ready for all the questions that I'm going to ask? Couldn't be readier, I guess. <laughs> let's, let's, let's start, yeah. Let's start with Google. Great. Uh, I think Google is a very, very aspired company for many people out there. How did you worked there for almost three years. Yeah. Yeah. How was that experience really like? How did it help you grow as a designer? It, there's, a, there's a fun story behind uh, how I ended up at Google, right? Um, you know how like every, when every uh, uh, person is young, like in their household, like there, there's always dreams of like ending up uh, in a, in a uh, big company, right? And obviously my family being very uh, tech first, my dad is an engineer, my mom, uh, is also very into uh, technology. Um, from a very young age, like she wanted me to kind of end up in like a big company like that. So this was like a family uh, dream of sorts, right? And uh, uh, that's why, uh, like when I started my career as a designer, obviously one uh, goal was to hopefully one day end up in a company like that. Um, when I was uh, working with Ola on some of the large scale projects, right? Like towards the uh, latter half of like that work, I started to think about like what next and uh, in terms of like consumer products or let's say if you if you think of like some of the larger scale products uh, obviously a company like Google would be top of that list right so uh, an old friend uh, had actually joined there already she referred me and uh, I, I took the interviews and it all went well and uh, I ended up joining the Google Cloud team in Bangalore right I think the the biggest difference, to be honest, uh, was uh, just the number of designers the company had, right? I was always used to having cultures where like uh, design bandwidth was always short, right? Like you always uh, try to figure out like, uh, you, know, you know, you have a project, like uh, how do you figure out like who is going to design it, who will, who will build it? Now you enter a company which has no shortage of resources, right? And uh, uh, no shortage of even getting new resources whenever they want. So that was new for me. I mean, it, and it, uh, it ended up being like this... Uh, beautiful journey where uh, uh, I would say like 60 to 70 percent of everything I am today or everything I've learned ended up being concentrated into that three-year wow. period where I was at Google yeah and uh, I mean we can go into details about like the the scale I saw and, and stuff like that thing uh, when I did some projects with photos and ended up in search but uh, I personally hold that entire experience very close to my heart yeah it was it was one of the best times of my life for sure I think uh, the biggest revelation, right? Like when I um, when I joined uh, Google Search, and and first of all, like I was uh, honestly like I had no uh, idea that there would be an internal interview process to get into Search. <laughs> so like yeah, you can enter Google from any team you want across the uh, across the entire uh, 
world, but uh, some teams hold their culture uh, very close to their heart, right? And like they have a very specific way of doing things. So in a way, Google is like a collection of many different companies. And search being so large, it is also one. Ended up moving to Mountain View also for that. Obviously, they weren't willing to move the role to Bangalore. Uh, this had to be in the in the main campus, right? So I, I went there, and uh, I think the main thing I I actually uh, it took a while to sort of internalize was uh, that Google Plex is a real place, right? Like it's a it's a real campus. Like you you uh, uh, these are all like real people, flesh and blood, who design experiences that we have sort of relied on for decades now, right? Like my mom, dad, family, friends, everybody uses uh, Google search. And when I met the people behind the scenes, right? Like and saw how humble, how normal they were, mm. right? That was, uh, it took me a while to kind of get used to that. Uh, and uh, there's no going back. Once you once you kind of get used to like, you know, normali normalization of like, yes, I mean, you could be designing Google search or or the the search box or, or uh, stuff in the, uh, on the search results page, like, it then ends up being like one more job, but it's it's a beautiful feeling because then like the impact and obviously the the lives you touch just uh, magnifies to uh, as as large as it can be. So it was beautiful in that sense. Uh, I think uh, the campus was phenomenal. I think the the entire culture the search team had was uh, that of like very research oriented, very mathematics and and. Uh, uh, science first, very analytics first uh, culture that I saw. And as a designer, I, I think uh, it was a, one of the most rare experiences that you can kind of uh, go through, uh, you know, being in the company of pretty much everybody being smarter than you. Yeah. Right. So like it was uh, really impactful in like personal character development as much as my development as a designer. Yeah. Wow. I I'm sure, you know, everyone at the house must be like, yeah, Google me job like gay. <laughs> <laughs> So, how long were you in the US? Two years. Two years. Yeah. So, a question that comes is that, how is the design culture in the States? Yeah. What's that difference really like in States versus India? How do people approach things differently? Yeah, I think the difference used to be larger. Uh, yeah. Back uh, in, I would say, 2015, 16, when I uh, interacted with a few folks, I, w I personally wasn't there. And uh, I started to get some more perspective into what the differences were in, in design there versus design here. I think now it's a bit uh, more aligned uh, in terms of how design is here. It's also because obviously people who have worked in that culture, a lot of them have come back. They're kind of bringing that culture here. A lot of them are also kind of uh, uh, moving between the two uh, geographies, right? So there's more assimilation of culture now. So I don't think there are, there are uh, very different uh, uh, things that you can find uh, now. But uh, to be specific about like what I what I really enjoyed there, right? I think. Uh, just the uh, just the optimism, mm. right? I think uh, Silicon Valley uh, uh, was new to me, but uh, the th this was the most refreshing part of it all, right? Like just thinking that everything is possible and we will make it possible. Mm. And any person you meet there, right? Uh, just having this kind of an upbeat uh, mood or upbeat uh, a point of view to their life, the work, the the advancements that they uh, are a part of, it, it made me very excited to be in technology, right? And I, I have no... Uh, I, you know, wonder now why people travel so often to the valley to get perspective and kind of get more excited mm -hmm. about our about stuff. Like right now, we are just, uh, I mean, we are uh, seeing that with AI, right? Like a uh, lot of AI founders travel there and and come back with mm -hmm. like uh, renewed uh, enthusiasm. So this was this was a uh, bulk of that. I think Silicon Valley had way more enthusiasm. I think they still do. Yeah. Versus, let's say, what we find uh, here, right? I think the talent gap has. Uh, now kind of caught up in India. I think uh, people now are, uh, in fact, in many areas, even more talented than uh, people you would find there. Um, but the general level of enthusiasm and just wanting to try things for the heck of it is, is still more uh, in the valley. Yeah. So, you know, when you when you talk about Google search, you said it's, it's incredible, amazing people. You work with the best of the best. Why did you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, this is this is kind of where the um, not so great parts of like uh, uh, you know the the whole uh, career building as a designer kind of come into picture, right? I think uh, Google is a phenomenal company. Uh, the challenge with having such a massive scale, right, and so many people is uh, having to create uh, you know uh, hierarchies in the in the system, right? And everybody is drafted into levels, and you kind of uh, uh, you know are calibrated on that. So now, as a designer, even if you're doing, let's say, really good work, 
in a company like Google, it becomes very difficult for the company to reward outsized performance with outsized rewards, right? Like they can't, let's say, promote you out of cycle. They can't promote you, let's say, I mean, everything is then about optics. Uh, your managers have to follow a system, a set of frameworks that are given to them. So with scale, like there comes a little bit of a, an intentional slowdown in careers also, right? And uh, I started to feel a little bit of that uh, in, in Google, right? Still a great place, obviously lots of learnings and all. Uh, the second thing was the pandemic. I, uh, I mean, the office is shut down, right? So, like, the beautiful campus is no longer accessible to anyone, <laughs> right? Uh, we were all locked into our houses. So, the entire benefit of being in Google is, like, getting a chance to meet people, have, like, those uh, uh, serendipitous meetings or, like, having coffee conversations and all. All of that stopped, right? So, now I have no access to anybody. We are all, like, uh, having meet calls all day long, right? And uh, it became closer to any other job than, let's say, the, the Google experience, right, if I'm being really honest. And uh, that's kind of where I started to kind of think about like, okay, how long is this going to go on for, right? Uh, how, or is this what I want to continue or should I like explore something else, mm. right? And uh, at that time, uh, uh, we had our first kid, right? Like, uh, uh, and he, uh, so for that reason, we wanted to be closer to the family as well. So all of these factored into kind of deciding to move and uh, Unacademy reached out at the time. So uh, they they had a really good, sort of a setup and, and the entire offer was uh, uh, the kind of role they were offering, right? And, and the kind of setup uh, and the phase in which the company was, it made a lot of sense career-wise for me to kind of take that up. You know, it was a leadership role. Uh, it would have taken me a long time to kind of climb through the ranks uh, in a setup like Google. So all in all, uh, strategically, it made more sense uh, to move and take this bet. Lovely. I think uh, one, one thing that we had a conversation on, right? It comes to Google, right? You told that Google search becomes B2C of sorts. Yeah. Cloud becomes B2B of sorts. You were told when we had a conversation that, you know, everyone should have that experience when it comes to B2B products. It's it's a great life. There are great there are great learnings and they are very different from B2C. Yeah. And designers today typically are afraid to go or work sometimes in B2B companies because they feel that limits them. You know, everyone wants that fanciness. Yep. Of I'm making products for the users. Yep. So what? why did you say that enterprise products is something that you should experience in at least once in a lifetime? There's a very simple reason at a higher level is that uh, in enterprise, the the unit economics or the, or the business case is very straightforward, right? Like people will only buy your product uh, if the product is actually solving a problem mm. and uh, they are paying real money for it. So they expect some real tangible value out of the product that you are selling them, right? A uh, lot of the areas where consumer gets it th uh, a, a little wrong, right? Or rather, I would say they they put off some of these harder questions about wanting to make money and all until very la uh, late into the game, which is because like they optimize for growth and all. Uh, you end up actually working in an environment that does not force you to think about business as a designer, right? And uh, you take any company, any consumer company that is optimizing for growth, you would see the design choices, the product choices they make are more liberal and are less grounded in like, uh, would this actually work when you have to make money out of it? Mm. In enterprise, you don't have this luxury. You, you yeah. have to, uh, I mean, you're selling a real product and there's a there's a check coming, uh, yeah. right, for, uh, for what you sell. Month on month. You, yes, so you have to, uh, uh, because of that equation being very clear, like the designers are drafted into a rule which is very clear. Hey, like you have to help solve a problem, right? Uh, design cannot uh, sort of sit or operate in isolation. It has to, uh, you know, fit into this this cycle of like build something useful, make it uh, understandable to the user, and like sell it to them, right? So, I would say, in my opinion, enterprise or B two C environment gives the right amount of importance to design. Uh, you know, if if uh, if I'm being really uh, mm. honest, uh, I think in consumer uh, because you are kind of shielded away from wanting to or have, uh, requiring to make sort of like a business work on day one you can be a little more liberal, uh, you know, in your design choices, you are not questioned as much. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at like, oh, what is the impact of my work, right? Like these types of questions come up is because that equation is not clear. Mm -hmm. Like you're designing something that kind of results into some uh, tangible movement in metrics and stuff, but like it's not, you, you're never held accountable. Correct. In enterprise, there's no room for error, right? Like yeah. there, there, there is a direct accountability to product and design. And I loved that when I was in Google Cloud, right? Like we, so the product I worked on, Google Admin Console, right? And then some of the uh, ancillary products with uh, the Admin Console. Netflix used to be a big customer, 
Okay, I mean, they still are, I think. Uh, they're a big Google Cloud customer. And we, a lot of our, uh, funnily, a lot of our roadmap came from, uh, you know, very high level discussions between the Netflix CEO and, and their leadership team with our leadership team. So then it's like, Yes, you have your roadmap, you, the team wants to build uh, this cool thing and like that uh, little cool feature, but our customer wants this. Uh, so you better sideline all of that, focus on this, deliver this because there's a paycheck at, uh, at stake, uh, right? Like you're trying to win a contract here. And I, in a way, I liked that because it's like, yes, I mean, this is way closer to reality than whatever we were building out of a whim or, or, or intuition or, or uh, any other uh, place, right? So I think... Uh, this is why I, I feel it's it, it was a it was an experience that humbled me down as a designer, and I think uh, people would benefit a lot. I mean, especially designers if they went through this this kind of an experience where, like, the rubber meets the road. True. Yeah. You, yeah. Like you're, you're not uh, in your own little yeah. world of imagination. There is, there is no there is room for experimentations, but not in yeah so much. And and but believe me, like when I when I say that uh, the reality is uh, way more clearer in enterprise i also mean uh, i don't i don't mean to say that there's not uh, there's no room for like uh, doing really good work which yeah. is still design first a lot of companies like linear uh, uh, you know is a great example i think github has has been a phenomenal product still an enterprise product right they have shown that that you can still build a beautiful design first enterprise product also it's just that the constraints are way more real and they keep people grounded there yeah i don't know if you've heard about ram as a product, yeah. yeah. I, I love that product. I have not used it, but I've heard of it and I've heard people in the US using that from a company's perspective. They are designed first because yeah. one of their earliest hires was a founding designer who kind of led the entire journey over there. But that being said, Hardik, you know, what is your favorite? Is there a favorite B2B company? Let's say if tomorrow an academy, uh, you choose to leave it or anything happens. Yeah. Which B2B company would you choose to work? I would prefer to start uh, something. Uh, basically, like I, I love the journey of Kari who's, who started Linear, right? I think uh, his journey is very similar to what I would aspire to do one day, right? I think uh, he was, uh, I think he's, he's documented in his story, right? Like he was, he was really tired of like the state of having uh, these project management tools and he ended up building a great one, right? And he put all his, le his learnings from like the, the his time at Airbnb and... Uh, just working with like great design minded founders into building linear and it's it's giving a run for its money to like tools like Jira and, and uh, the other large, much larger organizations, right? So I think uh, it would be beneficial overall to the industry if like more people who really understand and care about design, if they were to build businesses, because that's, I think the right way to kind of approach uh, and, and not enough people are doing it today. All right, I mean, a startup, uh, think of an Apple when you're Starting off that. <laughs> so, with that being said, Hardik, you know, you talked about Google and you talked about how at Google you met some phenomenal people. And in our conversations before, you had told me you met product managers, directors, other people, you know, just great. What did you kind of learn from them in specific? Like, there yeah. must be some specific things you remember clearly. And did you ever apply that in an academy because that was your leadership role after that? That's where the yeah. real deal, your real leader role started, right? Correct, correct. One thing I learned, uh, a fun exercise, right? I, I used to do often was uh, uh, calendar stalking, right? And this is something that uh, I learned also at Google. Like somebody, I, I forgot actually who it was. It was, uh, I think it was a product manager I worked with. And uh, she told me that, uh, I mean, how they, like you would actually learn more about what's happening in the organization if you just talk to people's calendars, right? And in Google, because of this this being like a culture of like transparency and all, people just open up their calendars, right? Mm. So I what I ended up doing was in Google Calendar, I would just add all the team members that I worked with and I saw what they were doing, right? Or what kind of meetings they were attending and mm. like what what where they spent their time, including leadership. Remember, I used to stalk the calendar of Kai, who was the director of yeah. design, my, my boss's boss, right? And uh, I ended up realizing what he spent time on. And it was just insane amount of reviews, right? Number of planning meetings that he held, number of like uh, promo calibrations, performance calibrations, one-on-ones, um, you know, design reviews. And it gave me a glimpse of like what, you know, the uh, w what my life would be if I were to, let's say, take on a leader's role. And uh, I think safe to say it hasn't been actually that different uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I ended up taking it in an academy. Obviously, very different scale. But uh, 
there are traces of that. So I think my early peek into what leadership could look like uh, started from just uh, a lot of observation of people uh, at at Google. Yeah, it's 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 so different. You know, like you looked at a certain person's calendar, and you know now you know what my life is very yeah. relevant to that. That being said, Adik, you know, you talked about Google life, life as somewhere you were creating an impact, but not fully a leader yet. Let's talk about Unacademy now. You know, how was that life where you were in Google, things were, you had definitely a lot of priorities, but now Unacademy is leading team, building a team. How was that experience really like? This is a great part of Zoom into it. I joined, uh, funnily, I joined uh, while I was still in the US. Uh, <laughs> my orientation happened uh, at a 13 hour time zone difference, right? So I, I was uh, at 3 a.m. I'm taking like an orientation call, right? Like uh, understanding what the team structure is. <laughs> that was a fun, uh, fun call. But uh, no, I think uh, we were in the middle of pandemic when I joined. And hence, uh, when I even moved back to India, I went to Ahmedabad, my hometown. And uh, the, I mean, an academy is in Bangalore, right? So we, uh, we were still remote. People are uh, confined in their houses. And uh, here I am, uh, waking up one fine day. I, I've just came, uh, I've just come back from uh, the US and still jet lagged, you know, and, and taking morning calls, uh, trying to figure out what's happening in, in an academy, right? And uh, I still remember an academy was uh, in the middle of uh, a massive launch in my first week of working with them. And uh, obviously, founder was involved. They were doing design reviews, and I'm trying. Here I am, like completely clueless, <laughs> trying to uh, you know sound smart in a meeting, right? Like, hey, okay, here are my two cents, you know, like, and, and people are like, ठीक है, you know, like we we have this launch tomorrow. Are they ठीक है? Great suggestions. We'll come back to those later. Uh, we'll we'll talk for V about V two later, right? And uh, two cents in an accent. My two cents in an accent. Yeah, I was still <laughs> trying to get rid of that accent. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but it's it, it was a uh, it was a big big culture shift. I mean, uh, Google is is like a giant iceberg moving extremely slowly, methodically, uh, with a lot of uh, intent uh, and and uh, calculated moves, right? Uh, while an academy, uh, in in many ways, is is like this hundred miles an hour train, you know that that kind of uh, stops for no one, you know, and uh, basically there is no. There's no ramp up time, right? Like when you join an academy, like you just, uh, which I still consider is the best way, on honestly, to onboard. I mean, it's a little controversial, but uh, I, I stand by that. Uh, people are just thrown into situations, right? Like, hey, look, here's the team setup, here's the project, here's what you're expected to do. You start. That's how I also started. That's how I also start any designer who uh, joined uh, my team. So there are very few like uh, formal conversations, right? Like, okay, this is this is what you're supposed to do. You know, like this. Uh, there's this little person who's working on this project. No, you're taking notes on the side while you're also trying to like have a conversation and you're f uh, forming like this mental picture of like what is happening. Yeah. Right? So that's what my initial few weeks uh, were like. And and uh, uh, I still remember this this uh, little chair that I sat on in Ahmedabad in my, in my uh, study slash bedroom, um, you know, trying to make sense of it all. And then I realized I can't do remote. I have to go meet the team in office, right? Like there were a few members coming to office at the time and I was like, I have to move to Bangalore, right? And I ended up, uh, I think it took me around four or five days to find a house. I found the first house that I uh, that I liked. I finalized that and uh, moved to Bangalore. And that's when it started to make a lot more sense, right? Like seeing the people, meeting them, having conversations, uh, especially with my, uh, I mean, the, one of the co-founders who I report to, uh, he helped me kind of understand and make sense of it all. Like, look, Hardik, this is what's expected out of you. Um, this is the kind of team. These are the challenges that you would have to help solve. You know, this is where the company is. And then I was like, finally, like there is some method to the madness, right? Otherwise, <laughs> I mean, being remote, honestly, like it would have just taken me like another month to to kind of uh, find my feet. But uh, moving was the right call. And uh, yeah. I never went back to Ahmedabad <laughs> for uh, more than three days after that, ever since I moved to Bangalore, it's been around close to three years now. I, I would say, I think I've pretty much been in office every single day, <laughs> barring the mandatory lockdown where government said you can't leave your house, that those were the only days I was working from home. I have attended uh, office uh, every single day. And I think uh, that's, I mean, we'll come to that uh, later, but I think that's also what my role uh, has demanded out of me is to kind of be there. No, I, 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 I'd like to take it now itself. So. Every single day, you have so many leaves, 
Yeah. So many things to do. Go out, chill, go to Goa, have fun. You have a wife, you have a kid, you know, have fun. Why didn't you do that? What really, dem- what was that demand? And is that, is that demand expected out of everyone who's a leader? <clears throat> I would say, um, there is this, uh, uh, there's this uh, really uh, uh, inspirational leader boss tank, right? Like he heads uh, VR at Facebook. Um, I look up to him and I, he, he's done some phenomenal writing. He wrote about uh, conspicuous leadership, right? Which in, in, in which he says that uh, as a leader, you have to be absent sometimes, right? To really um, test out how capable your team is um, in, in uh, putting out the fires when you're not there, right? I think uh, that's great advice. But what I've ended up learning is that in a, in a rapidly moving uh, company like Unacademy where the amount of things we have in our portfolio, right? In parts, this is true that I can be absent, right? Like, and we have really good uh, team to take care of everything. But at the same time, given how large the portfolio is, I can't be fully absent because I'm always required somewhere, right? And uh, that has pretty much been true my entire tenure here at Unacademy. So, and, and I, I no complaints, right? Like I actually, this is how I also like working. And uh, uh, again, like there are always schools of thoughts around like uh, remote work versus in-person. I'm a big proponent of in-person work. That's how I've grown. I've learned everything I have uh, by just looking at people, being in the company of people, uh, you know, being on the floor, uh, right? So I, I have zero regrets of uh, actually missing out on like occasional, you know, beach uh, trips and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I would not have been able to do what I've done if I had optimized for time out of office or time away from office, yeah. But shouldn't it, you know, so many designers talk about, hey, you know, it's it's very important. I need a creative break. And it's it's good. I mean, I understand. But does that not hinder your creativity for not taking a break? 100%. I think uh, you you do need your outlet where you kind of switch off, right? And uh, uh, I have realized uh, this the hard way when uh, I was just nonstop switched on for months on end, right? And uh, I started realizing that the quality of my ideas or quality of my yeah. suggestions or, or inputs declined. I mean, uh, I I could see clearly that uh, somebody else was able to come up with like very obvious things that I should have honestly seen coming or like I should have al- already thought of, right? Not that that's necessarily like a bad thing, but uh, objectively also, right? Like I could see my own, uh, uh, you know, application of skills to de- uh, started declining and uh, I have taken breaks. I mean, I have now uh, aligned on a routine that works uh, better. I, I take breaks. Uh, I, I take like one big trip a year, right? Like we we are uh, gone for like two weeks, and I uh, do weekend trips and stuff. And uh, but obviously the constraints or the or the demands of the role are still there, and hence uh, I sometimes have to just force myself to kind of uh, you know still figure out a way to be creative or 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 uh, just push harder, you know, or yeah. sometimes even take. Uh, lot of help from the team, uh, you know, who's extremely talented and I, I've been lucky enough to uh, have have uh, such great people in the team. They help fill the gaps when I'm, you know, falling short or like I'm not uh, able to be 100%, right? Yeah, I think that really helps. But when you're talking about this phenomenal team, right, at an academy, and let's go back in this conversation a little bit. You left Google, came to an academy, a lot of pressure, lots of things to do you built a team there. Yeah. But was that team existent when you came in? How did you build that team? What was the thought process? Who should I be hiring? Who oh, I need five people here? Because it's a yeah. mammoth of a product. And I I think in during COVID, right? Especially an academy grew multifold. Yeah. So the challenges that came along with it. Can you tell me what were those priorities? What did your, yeah. what is the mindset, etc.? When I when I joined an academy, I think the first big project we had taken up was redesigning the entire app. I spoke <laughs> with the founder. We said, uh, "Fine, we have this product. Uh, it's uh, it's not going to meet the demands of you know the next set of features or or uh, capabilities we want to add uh, to the product." I think we will have to figure out a way to uh, uh, you know like make this happen, right? Now, obviously, as a leader, it's very exciting when you join a new company and they're open to throwing what they have and like starting fresh. Uh, it's it's a dream for a leader, right? Like uh, great, like that's that's where you kind of um, you know uh, plan to leave your mark, kind of like have a fresh right. start. Uh, with that comes the challenge of like, okay, do we have the people for it? You know, like yes, that that's a mammoth effort. And uh, so when I joined, uh, we uh, I've written about this. Like I I uh, sat with the team that was there, 
we we kind of uh, it, it wasn't an interview but i was trying to understand the capabilities that were there at the time in the team right and uh, some people uh, were either not up to the mark some people did not really want to continue they weren't uh, willing to go through this whole change of like having a very different person in charge now right so we we did a little bit of a reshuffling uh, within the team and uh, i i remember i had eight people left at the team uh, in, in the team at the time right and uh, they were i mean obviously very talented and like motivated to continue but eight were not enough so we started this whole building exercise okay how many do we need right like and uh, i still remember just this grueling exercise of uh, um building sheets of like sourcing talent and like okay how do we figure out like leveling we need a calibration ladder we have no levels in the company what do we uh, you, you know like what what are the levels we want to hire for and uh, how do we what's the interview panel right like uh, who's going to be uh, dedicating time to this we also have to do work it's eight people team but some of them also have to interview because i can't be the only one doing that so there was this 3 4 month period where like we were just all hands on deck like everybody has to chip in you know like and and contribute to building out the team right and uh, i i think i went through personally about 150 portfolios at the time uh, we had a great uh, uh, you know talent uh, a ta person i worked with uh, she helped procure lots and lots of portfolios i i at one point i uh, you know the fun thing about design portfolios is that they're very low signal to uh, noise right like you have to really find uh, the i mean you have to put in a lot of effort to figure out whether someone's a good designer or not right. is because within the entire industry i mean people just don't have enough guidance on how to build good portfolios so i was a you know, it was quite a quite a bit of a chore but we ended up hiring I think in around five months' time, we closed uh, around four or five design leads. Uh, th- these are the L seven, uh, level seven. I call uh, in in our calibration. This was my backbone, basically. This these L sevens were basically what I uh, kind of structured my entire team around. Uh, you know, and uh, I think uh, these have been some of the best people that we've had. Uh, you know, I think we've had two of them leave uh, recently, and uh, I still have. four of them and they are the ones doing all the heavy lifting so if i'm able to take vacations it's because of them right because all of them have now uh, taken up uh, pretty big charters and they've just understood like our dna a lot better and uh, so it was it was that like i i couldn't sleep easy until i hired that that l7 layer right and once the, once they were in like we were in a very strong position yeah yeah what's the hardest part about being a leader very honest it's uh, continuing to be inspirational uh it's incredibly hard i mean there are days when i wake up and i i realize like should i tweet this should i have this uh emotional outburst like i'm really frustrated tired like can i just voice it out and in many uh, on on many days i i just second guess myself i can't i mean i can't always express everything i feel i can't uh, be pessimistic i can't be uh you know like the uh, you know criticizing someone's work beyond a point like there are words that i have to choose you know and there is there is a way i have to carry myself on the floor publicly even within the company in front of other leaders that is the character change that you go through right and uh, i did not imagine the that it would take this level of conscious effort you know to change myself into a different person right like uh, i have this thing where uh, so i i I genuinely love cracking jokes, right? And uh, often times, like we veer into weird territories when you make jokes, right? Like, and I, I had to kind of start to watch what I what I made jokes on and what I couldn't make jokes on anymore, yeah. right? So, like, yeah, I mean, you can be uh, you can be as uh, funny as you want or as yourself as you want in your peer group, but uh, being inspirational to the people who potentially would work with you one day, or or uh, uh, you would want to be inspirational to them, like that, that was a hard change. and uh, this is because as a leader you if you want to have a long career as a leader you always have to be someone that other people would want to work with uh that's not an option you have like you will always be building teams no matter where you go so if uh, if someone if you have said some things in the past or like if you have actually rubbed someone the wrong way or if you have held grudges uh, you know if you have any of that kind of a history like it doesn't bode well for you to be able to build a future team again so you it's almost like you have to be hireable as a leader would someone want to hire you as a leader is their leader right like and and to continue being that has been the toughest thing right like and i think about it every 
day when I go to bed and every morning I wake up. Is there is there a note section in your phone where you ranted about all this and you just? You know? That's the only place where I rant. Yeah. Uh, right, it's, it's my private notes. <laughs> I can't rant anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and and uh, no, it's real, right? Like uh, whenever I'm unhappy with a situation or like uh, I, I'm just uh, I have this moment of like uh, so much, so many thoughts are pent up in in, in me, right? Like uh, the only place where I take them out is private notes and. Uh, Whenever that turns into something that can be useful to other people, like I reframe it entirely, take out all the other words and then uh, <laughs> publish it. Yeah, That's like a leadership lesson that you can publish that as. Yeah. Uh, that one thing is when you built the team and an academy, you went through all the assets and you finally found those leaders. In that process of building, what was your takeaway out of that? One very important thing I learned was uh, People are always ready for larger roles. Uh, you know, like they, they're always uh, uh, up for a bigger challenge, up for like more ch larger of a charter, like, hey, like Hardik, I'm here, but like, I really want to be here, right? And uh, in my current setup, wherever I am in X company, Y company, like it's going to take me like three years, right? I feel I'm ready. Like you interview me at this level, right? And calibrate me at that level. You test me all you want, but give me this larger responsibility. And if I fail you, you can kick me out. That's fine. Right. And I love that. I love that. It's because it's exactly the journey that I've lived. Right. Like I, I strongly feel that you're never ready for the role that you, mm. uh, that you kind of want to take up. But if you are willing to go 15 hours, uh, 15 hour days to fill that gap and match up to it, that's where career acceleration happens. Right. And I, I saw that uh, in some of the L7s we hired, people were like very honest about it. And I love that. I, I love when someone's a uh, someone's someone has that shark mentality about their career, right? Like, um, I don't want to like climb traditional ladders or levels and all like that's too slow. But, like, I don't want to do that. I feel like some of the skills that I've acquired, uh, I've acquired them at a faster rate than other people, and I'm I'm ready for a bigger challenge. Age should not matter, and I I, I love that. I mean, you're ready when you're good enough, not when it, when you're old enough, right? And uh, that's how it works in sports, and and this is how I also see careers to be like they're like sports, and I I. I mean, you as a leader would be lucky if you are able to consistently find these types of people who are punching way above their weight, you know, and this is a phrase uh, my mentor told me, right? Like, hey, Ardek, if you want to really, uh, you know, not end up like me, yeah. uh, he was talking about himself, right? Like, I think you can really punch above your weight and and uh, just say the right things, do the right uh, kind of work, pick the right problems to work on and just be extremely sincere. And if you find a leader who is able to spot that, they'll pull you up. Well, pull you up is because leaders want to pull people up as as much as they see the intent and the hard work. Every single time, I would love to promote people faster than average. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like I I don't mind doing that at all. So that's one thing that I've learned or or almost started to kind of keep an eye out for. Yeah, and I, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen here, my company, multiple other companies. And you, what you're saying is, you know, if why would someone say no to? Something that's you know that you that you know that you are going to excel in or probably you can be better at and I understand that. So there's uh, there's one more uh, there's one more thing here about uh, hiring. Uh, one one secret that I kind of it, it's it's uh, a little counterintuitive if uh, it could be is that uh, leaders want to work with talented people. They like you know funny thing uh, whenever I'm walking into an interview right I'm interviewing someone for a role. I wanted them to succeed way more yeah. than they probably wanted themselves to succeed. I'm like, please do not mess this up. I want you. <laughs> I, I in all likelihood have loved your work, right? L let's pray that I don't end up catching like a red flag or or like let's say your yeah. intent is out of place or like something that kind of flips me off. I want you to succeed. I'm going to help you in the interview to succeed. It's because I've done my homework. You're you're really good, and uh, it, this is only a a matter of kind of getting to know you better, right? So let's make sure this goes well mm. so that I can like get you here, right? People don't always understand this in the same way. They think like, oh, okay, you're coming from a position of like, obviously it's a no until it's a yes. I approach it very differently. I, I always approach it, it's a yes mm. until it's a no. Otherwise I wouldn't be wasting my time yeah. talking with you. If I'm giving you half an hour worth of an interview space, it's to make sure there's nothing else is off because work is clearly there, right? So. Leaders want to work with talented people. It's it's they always walk into conversations with that mindset. Correct. I, I've seen that happen, and I you know when you like you say you want that person to succeed so that somewhere you can 
figure out what next for yourself as well. You know, it's it's this a uh, entire idea. If I have someone who's selling pineapple in the way it's supposed to be sold, or if someone's designing extremely beautifully, extremely the right way, has has a whole has honed their craft really well. Please come here. You know, yeah. like the position is all here. Let me move on to yeah more focused problems that I can evolve into. I mean, if I see good work is there, I want to get to working together ASAP. I don't want to waste time in like having this conversation, that conversation. Let's do a peer review. Let's have like five more interviews. No, if you're good enough, and yeah. if I have enough uh, uh, seen enough, let's start. You know, like like and, and start ASAP. Like right? yeah. We, at Pineapple, when we started interviewing people, we had. Uh, a one interview, one assignment thing, you know, very like, yeah, because it was this T and I who used to take care of those interviews, small team, right? Yeah, uh, just get it done. We have a certain set of questions we would want to know, certain sort of skills that we want to be aligned on, certain social capabilities, certain cognitive capabilities, certain functional skills. Yeah, want to get aligned on those, and if you're good, take an assignment if necessary. Yeah. Show me how good you are at your functional craft, yeah. and then let's just move on. Get going, yeah. So I think the question is that at an academy, you're not just handling design for an academy. You're handling, you know, designs for cohesive, graphy, next level, which are extremely different products. Uh, and every product that you approach needs to have a different mindset to it. So how do you manage that? Yeah, I think we we started off with uh, having a central team for a for a very long time. Uh, I, I think upwards of uh, six, seven months, which is long because a lot of these are zero to one efforts. Um, and we realized that uh, that was not scalable because uh, the test prem business is obviously uh, a lot uh, mature and uh, the product is way more mature than the, some of the other ones, which meant that the kind of problem statements that designers worked on were very different. And uh, because all of these, uh, uh, our, our other zero to one bets are in very different areas, there's very little overlap. So, um, we started realizing that apart from sharing usual updates at high level, like there is not much to gain from like keeping a central team and central processes and central way of reviewing and, and uh, uh, working. Uh, that's when we started splitting teams out. So now today the setup looks like uh, uh, this where every zero to one effort is uh, one design lead mapped to that. They lead that entire area. We have minimal interactions between uh, everybody combined. Right, and uh, I, it's, it's more like a tree topology where like I'm kind of in the center and like then everybody else is uh, working on their stuff. And I think this is way more efficient because then I can triage my time uh, based on where most amount of value can be delivered by putting more attention, right? Earlier, mm -hmm. it was more evenly split, but that clearly wasn't the most scalable way. But you, you know, even you being the center and you know, you having a lead working on each of each and every product, but it still means that your mindset needs to be different, you know, when I'm having a one-on-one -on -one with next level lead, my mindset has to be completely changed. Yeah. Got the same with Graphy, the same with an academy. Yeah. How does that kind of span out mentally? Yeah, 100%. I, I don't evenly spend my time on all of the efforts. Um, in uh, in a few areas, I've delegated it, uh, delegated decision-making, design reviews and all to my design leads. In other areas where we're still figuring out the product, it's still very, very high level and early. Uh, I get down to uh, way more granular detail. We do design reviews. I even sometimes end up designing, co-designing with my uh, design lead is because that's the that's the need of the hour in those areas. So I my, my calendar reflects more or less like what, what I end up spending time on and that's uh, the more more towards the zero to one areas than let's say the test prep or an academy side of things. And uh, which is why like there is no even split. Yeah. It's, it's around, uh, it's roughly 80, 20 towards uh, the zero to one, yeah. Got one interesting question that came out of this conversation is, do you still use Figma? We do. Yes. Do you use? <laughs> I use Figma. I'm uh, in Figma every day. I uh, still design. And if you want, we can go into the details of like why that's also important for design leaders. But uh, I, I'll summarize that in one line. I would, uh, as a even as a leader, I would never. I don't hope to ever get away from craft myself. Yeah, and I think that's something that Dishti also follows very, very diligently. She is, you know, there are two types of leaders, you know, one who can be strategic, but there's a second one who can be hands-on with the team, really understand what challenges they're facing yeah. functionally as well, and really solve them along with this more strategic decision. So I, I, I truly agree that that's more impactful in every way. Yeah. Uh, one person is a manager, one person is a leader. 
सो हार्दिक एजुकेशन इन इंडिया और एक्चुअली ग्लोबली इज इज अ वेरी ग्रेसिव चैलेंजिंग मार्केट स्पेशली सिंस द टाइम इज गॉन डिजिटल इट्स इट्स नॉट एन ईजी बिजनेस टू स्केल एंड गेटिंग द इंटायर वर्ल्ड द इंटायर कंट्री टू यूज योर प्रोडक्ट और एनी एड्यूटेक प्रोडक्ट टू लर्न फ्रॉम देयर हाउसेज एंड दैट अलॉन्ग विद चैलेंज लाइक डाइवर्सिटी कल्चर every state having a different you know a different syllabus yeah. multiple things on those fronts right how do you move around those and how do you tackle these challenges yeah um one uh, one interesting learning uh, with education right and uh, i i i remember writing down like some of the building blocks for designing for education uh, uh, right when i joined an academy um some of those hold true some of those are no longer true as i have seen over the last 3 years um but one of the biggest ones uh that that one of the biggest learnings has been that uh, it is incredibly hard to uh cultivate motivation in users right and when i say users in our case it's students right uh if they're fundamentally not motivated to study or if if they do not want to let's say clear an exam or 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 uh, give it a, a really sincere go and digital products actually have not proven to have much of an impact on the motivation part right what what we see in data is also uh, exactly that um people buy subscriptions people try out our product they they study on it for a for a bit but the amount of drop offs uh, in terms of like do i even want this like do i even want to attempt this exam is is pretty high that the amount of drop offs that we see and that's because in general also we see that in like also uh, you know coaching centers or 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 even uh, uh, all these uh, uh, very difficult to crack exam uh, prep routines right um i myself i I've, i've been in that uh, journey as well like i um, prepared for iit jwe i couldn't clear it i never even gave it a, a whole hearted go so i can empathize with that right a lot of people realize after going into it it's not for them right so we we see that that it's very hard to reactivate those users right like once they are gone it's 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 there's not much you can do but at the same time the dependence on uh, overall on uh, technology is a very interesting thing that the industry is still figuring out right like what what is that new um, fundamentally new offering that technology is providing yes there are educators we have put them on phone screens so now you can see the lecture that you were actually uh, watching in the classroom we have sorted that right like in the best way possible like there's no lag it's like real time streaming this chat this reactions quiz uh, doubt solving all of that can uh, technology go beyond that i think collectively bulk of the edtech startups are figuring that part out mm-hmm. right like where else can we actually play a role and uh, i think as an academy we are one of the very few companies probably the only one who even has given like whole hearted attempts at that compete the launch that you saw right like was really thinking about like what if we could give people a way to objectively know where they stood in their preparation like there's no tool for that uh compete was supposed to do that and i think to a large extent uh, it it showed us a lot of things it did right a lot of things it didn't do right right i think uh, one learning was that uh, people really got that there were enough people who also got demotivated when they actually saw that they right. weren't actually uh that 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 good. Were good to begin with so i think uh, this whole like competitive aspect of education is is a is a is one that we are still grappling with right like how it en- ends up affecting learners some of them get uh, get extremely motivated right like oh like it's 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 like sports and i want to kind of do better this is exactly the game i want to play some people realize oh it's sports i mean i will have to work hard and win like there's there's like zero sum uh, dynamic at play i don't want to play so you end up like deciding either way and and uh, that uh is a, is a fun sort of a realization and and uh, which is why like now we have taken sort of a step back on like hey like maybe we shouldn't like over index on you know this competitive nature because it doesn't work for everyone uh but the ones who are really good they end up getting that signal from other places also so there are plenty of that we don't probably need to hurt the ones who are not let's say in the top 20 or top 50 percentile right like because otherwise they'll probably just end up giving up and that's not good for them either yeah right so these are the types of learnings i think as a I, I, and uh, the part i'm really proud about is is, is proud of is uh, that we are that company who has actually even bothered to explore these nuances of like what if we try this what if we try that right like what what works right like what does the mind space of these learners looks like 
And, and uh, I'm happy to have discovered some of these myself, front and center being in the process of building, right? Like versus, let's say, just reading off of some other company's uh, attempts. So at every point in time, do you say that we're innovating on something or the other all the time? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, learning as a as a domain, I think I would I would probably put it as a larger domain than just education. I think education, if it's goal driven, then we see test prep. Uh, education as a as a baseline indicator of uh, of uh, you know uh, social status, and we have schools and all where you kind of just end up getting like a board certificate, right? But then there's also learning where you where you learn because you want to improve on something or because you want to let's say. I mean, I mean, uh, Duolingo is a great example, right? Like, why is it so successful is because, like, uh, people want to study English as a language because it opens up new avenues for careers for them, right? Like, uh, it, 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 it's almost like there is something you can learn that gives you back something else, which is, which is what I call, like, uh, result-driven learning. But at the same time, like, the other, other insight we've had is that people don't learn just for the sake of it. Yeah. There, there's no such thing as, like, I'll just learn because it's, uh, it's fun, right? Like there are very few people who learn because it's fun. There's, there's always some motive attached. So if you are able to find those, uh, that 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 uh, that if if I learn this and then I in return get this, you can think of an interesting product in that domain that you can come up with. And I we we play in that space. Got it. Uh, I'm gonna take a slightly tougher turn here. All right, an academy as a company has gone through two layoffs now and you as a leader have a massive role to play in terms of let's say managing the team's motivations how the culture is how the environment during that time is super stressful what was that journey like for you yeah how did you kind of tackle that emotional stress plus you know obviously the sad news yeah yeah i think uh as a as a company i think even our ceo has vocally talked about it very very uh, proactively is that we were one of the few companies who acted fast, right, and acted uh, in in uh, with with the urgency that this this uh, required. Um, I think as a leader, uh, personally speaking, if if uh, I reflect back on that time, was uh, when I hired the designers. Obviously, I had no intention of ever seeing the day where I would have to tell them to kind of, yeah, of uh, give them the sad news, right? And uh, this was a new experience for me. Um, I wasn't prepared for it. I remember having many. Uh, I mean the the days leading up to it, right? Like when I got to hear that we would have to do this, it's it's obviously for the general good of the company. Hey, you as a leader are in this weird space where obviously uh, you're a leader of the people, but at the same time you have a duty to this uh, to the to the company, right? Like you, uh, you you have to align your interests with like what what is what is right for the company. Mm. Uh, so balancing both of them is this kind of uh, a very weird zone in your head where uh, it makes you take very hard decisions you may not be uh, okay with initially right and uh, i i i just couldn't uh, sleep well I, I mean for for a few days i remember having a very tough time even eating uh, dinner on time my wife and i spoke about this uh, you know she was giving me ways to kind of deal with it obviously new experience for her as well this was uh, this was tough and uh, even when i gave the news right Honestly speaking, I think because the environment was so bad overall, right, across the industry, I was surprised how mature and like how receptive some of the people who actually were on the receiving end of this were. I mean, how gracious they were. I remember uh, uh, speaking to one of the very uh, young designers who who was probably, I think, the junior most member of the team. He he was handling it a lot better than I was on the call, right? Like, And I felt so bad for him and he was like, how they get so okay, I understand you have to do this. I'm sure in a different time you wouldn't have uh, done this. So I'm, I know how hard it is for you. And I just couldn't process that, right? Like how could somebody have such uh, uh, such an emotional maturity to take this news, this being their first job? Yeah. Right? So it taught me a lot about how mature we as an industry are, right? Even despite still being very young, right? And uh, a lot of people who I broke the news to were young. Some of them, this was their first job and they took it incredibly well. And uh, I now, having uh, gone past a few months after that, I still am in touch with, I think pretty much all of them, uh, you know, still uh, catch up uh, about like how they're going uh, about their careers, you know, like are they well settled and stuff. 
uh, I think uh, as a company also, we took some good measures to help them out with outplacement support and all. I'm happy with that. Uh, and, and and I think, uh, uh, but yeah, overall, uh, it, it, it made me almost like a uh, like a more empathetic uh, leader now. I, I uh, respect and value what I have a lot more than uh, probably where I was. I, I think a few months before, you know, like people can't take jobs, opportunities, uh, career growth, support system, the team for granted. Uh, you have it today. You may not have it uh, another day, and very little is in your control. And uh, this this experience taught me that. Yeah. Can you say that that's that was the worst time in your life throughout, um, or one of the? I think uh, I genuinely felt bad for the people who had to go through this. Um, personally, I don't think it was as bad for me. Uh, I can't say that uh, you Correct. know it was bad for me. I, I mean, a lot of people had it way worse, right? Um, I was delivering the news, but the people who were receiving, obviously, uh, it was. Uh, way harder for them but yeah I think uh, it was new and uh, if if God forbid like if this ever comes again and if I have to deal with this again I would probably uh, take a lot of measures up front to not have anybody else in my team or or uh, uh, people that I'm responsible for they shouldn't end up in this situation because let's say we couldn't see this coming or we didn't plan better mm-hmm. like I would uh, be very cautious about that going forward right like Things like, hey, should we even hire more designers? You know, like, should we grow the team or like make do with like better planning, better focus? You know, so I would probably think of like, how do we not end up in that situation as an industry? You know, like not just my team. Yeah. So, I think uh, we talked about a stressful time for layoffs. I'm gonna continue that with one question, and then we are gonna come to better questions, less stressful ones. Sure. So, were there any times where you felt, you know, anguished, hopeless, probably, or annoyed at certain things that happen and we just talked about that where you kind of ran things on your notes yeah uh maybe we you know you could talk a little bit about what those notes are about if not a yeah. note in specific i think one one very important role we play as leaders right uh, to our team uh, for our team is uh, being able to give them clarity and focus they deserve um if at any point in time your team is struggling to grapple with uh, lack of clarity, not knowing what we are trying to do or uh, where we are headed, or they do not have the right guardrails for, for within which to think about, that becomes very unproductive for the team. And every time my team has pointed that out to me, and I don't have an answer for them, that's those are the times uh, when I look back, like those are the times where I felt a little bit of uh, restlessness as a leader, right? Because I try to uh, avoid that. I try to add as much... Uh, 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 you know, context and and uh, and uh, as many details as I can, so that we, as a team, can continue working. Um, I think it could be about a project. It could be about, let's say, something we are building. We don't know what we are building. Let's say, uh, if it if it's uh, that kind of a problem statement where we are still figuring it out, but we also expect, uh, you know, very detailed and structured output from the team but the team does not have the necessary details to come up with something, right? And they have, rightfully, they have some fundamental questions. Uh, when you don't have an answer, when you're trying to figure out the answers yourself, that is a dynamic that uh, took me a while to kind of know how to navigate that, right? Like, because a very interesting part here that now comes into picture is you discussing or or, or uh, figuring out the answers from your, uh, your boss or your uh, leaders, right? You need that because you need to transpire that to your team, right? Are they, uh, let's say, how do we think of monetization? How do we think of, let's say, gamification in this product? Yeah, I myself may not have answers, but it's my job to go figure out the answers, collectively align, and then give them the answers, right? Otherwise, how would they design or how would they do their work? So it, every time that has happened, I think I feel like uh, I could be doing more. I could be actually uh, working harder to, let's say, arrive at some closure so that I can, you know, uh, unblock the team. So I think unblocking the team uh, zone is is where like I, I most of my anguish moments are, if if any. Yeah. All right. So Hardik, with anguish, you know, we talked about that. When you when we kind of went through the Play Store, and we saw a couple of comments, and I just want to highlight those. Sure. Uh, a couple of negative comments. 
there is no consistency in UX UI. That was comment number one. College going people could have made a better. <laughs> 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 okay, so how do these comments affect you? You know, it's it, these are just two. Yeah, that I'm sure there'll be more, right? There are millions of users for you guys. So how do you handle that? How do you build better apps? Yeah, I think uh, in our uh, throughout our experience, uh, I, I remember a time when we launched our redesign. Right, uh, we we made a, a few assumptions during the time when we did the redesign that were uh, I would say let's say not they did not sit well with some of the uh, some of the learners and we got a lot of very vocal feedback. And I remember because we were we were down in the weeds with them, right? Like we were daily discussing with our users about what worked, what did not work. And so the feedback was like very, very clear, right? Like, and, and uh, uh, I think here's the challenge with uh, designing for education for the kind of scale where we operate uh, at an academy. We have over 100 different exams that we cater, uh, cater to, right? Now, with that comes a challenge of like, what is the right design for every single category that you serve, right? Um, obviously, there are parts that are common that work well, like you you have tests, practice tests that you give, you mock tests, uh, you have mock tests, you have practice questions, you have, let's say your schedule, you have like your classes, courses, videos. Now, the challenge with this is the, uh, every exam is, you know, uh, is a different cohort. Yeah. It's a different user. We have uh, the user base, uh, base uh, ranges from like a uh, student in, let's say, seventh, eighth standard, 10th standard to let's say, uh, uh, a person who's going for like a post-grad, who's, who's probably also, working, you know, part-time and they are also trying to, let's say, clear UPSC. Now that's a huge uh, band to serve for, right? And uh, with that comes this added challenge of like, where do we, uh, where do we stay, right? Like we, 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 uh, if this is the spectrum, right? Like where do we uh, kind of uh, align ourselves and our experience? And uh, we took a conscious call to kind of uh, have a very uh, baseline approach uh, approach where we we try to keep the baseline higher than let's say the best product in that category right and uh, you pick any any major category and you figure out like okay like uh, this is the user expectation you stay above that and that's great right but obviously at the same time if we had let's say a larger team or a, like if we could we would go very 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 deep in every single category as well right like we would design let's say a separate app for iit jw because let's say those users need something else mm -hmm. uh, we would have like a very different app for upsc because those users let's say rely more on recorded content because that's uh, you know that's working class people who also are over, they only have time to let's say watch lessons uh, in the evening yeah. because because in the rest of the day they are working so live classes does uh, don't work as well for them so we will design a different experience for them so mm -hmm. there are all these nuances that that make it difficult if you really want to go deep. But at the same time, like if you are improving the baseline, you are still doing a great job because then you have a very trusted brand that 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 you have built among the user base and, and you can still offer like a better than uh, the baseline experience in a, on average across all categories. And that's the call we took. And hence, obviously, uh, we oftentimes see very passionate users, you know, um, not happy with some, some of the other decisions uh, that we made. But at the same time, when we speak to them, it turns out that the annoyance or or the or the the gripe is with something very very specific. Yeah, you know, and and uh, we have uh, taken measures to fix a lot of these, and and, uh, and and obviously we take all the feedback very seriously. But this is the challenge that comes with like you know building a building a horizontal brand across so many categories. Yeah, it's 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 very similar to you know, OTP niya am bagwasa. You know, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example, right? Like in my time at Google, uh, YouTube had a similar challenge. Um, YouTube clearly does not have the right features for, uh, let's say, watching gaming videos, right? Um, Twitch is a much better gaming video watching experience, right? But at the same time, like YouTube also serves so many different categories of users. Like there are, uh, you know, moms and dads watching, let's say, daily vlogs uh, of like very, uh, very uh, household creators, you know? Or let's say there are young people watching like stand-up comedy, or there are music music aficionados watching like concert videos. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible to build for everyone, yeah. right? And uh, that's why like I I'm now way more empathetic uh, having seen that side of the world, right? Like with Google, obviously, when when the challenge is you're designing for everyone, uh, and you can't question that because you want to be a global 
product, mm-hmm. then then obviously you would end up with a few people who are not happy with some of the choices you've made. Yeah. So I think I'm pretty much done with all the difficult, challenging questions of many. I want to go to your journey as a leader now. I want to understand that in your role as a leader, can you point out one single thing that is extremely, extremely crucial for you? Yeah. Um, have a very, very high uh, expectation bar for yourself as well as your team. There's no other way to be become and remain a relevant and an exceptional leader. But when you have a high exceptional, you know, highly, you know, higher bar for your team, you can have it for yourself, I'm sure. When you have it for your team, doesn't it become conflicting because you expect them to perform more than sometimes they're supposed to? And that becomes somewhere conflicting because it could it could go south in many cases. Yeah. No, it's a choice. It's a choice that I've made. Um, my singular goal for every member of my team is uh, that the day they decide that the journey with an academy ends, a better designer is walking out of the door than the one that had walked in. And what I mean by that is they are a better communicator. They are a more talented designer. They are more fearless. They're more confident in their abilities. And in order to make this happen, I cannot not have a very high bar and I can't not demand better from them. And that's the only way I've seen it work. That's also the expectation my leaders have from me. And uh, that's the culture we have set. And I'm extremely proud of that because I don't think I would be able to work in a, in, in a different environment where the demands are not exceptionally high because uh, it's impossible to do great work otherwise. That's a great way to put it, I think. Uh, so, you, you know, you talked about your leaders and I'm going to get to that, right? So, sometimes leaders, you call them managers, whoever, you, at times they have certain opinions, strong opinions, great, through data, through insight, however that might come to them. That, you know, we should be building a product or designing this product in this specific way or style. And while your team is telling you that, hey, I want some creative freedom here because I think I can do this thing better. Yeah. But again, it's it's like a huge banter, right? Management says something, you have, yeah. to, you have to manage both these expectations. How do you manage both of these expectations? Yeah, I think... Uh there's this way of saying, right, like uh, aligned on the direction, flexible on the details, right? Um, like you you have to work that out with your leaders. So if, if let's say I'm talking about me, I have to figure that out with the founders about uh, what are they not willing to negotiate on and what are they flexible about, right? Uh, in our uh, uh, environment, right, like uh, obviously I enjoy the fact that our founders are extremely design oriented. They, they understand the value in it. They understand the importance of doing it right. So in that sense, uh, I like that they have opinions. I like that they have uh, a point of view that they come and come, come up with. I think at the same time, we have seen, uh, like, I, I don't know how we ended up here, but uh, I'll give you an example, even with Compete, or there are other projects also, the entire execution, right? Like the entire uh, the detailing of the, the experience, the, the small decisions the team took. Even I was not involved in, in, in a lot of that. I think uh, what we discussed and decided was like, hey, look, we are envisioning a product like this where there would be a rating for every learner. Uh, there would be levels and there'd be like a leaderboard and there'll be like this one-on-one uh, real-time live engaging experience. That's it. Go. Figure it out. Right? And uh, I think the first, uh, first or second iteration the team came up with mm-hmm. had that and five more things. Oh. So they definitely ensured that like everything we were expecting to kind of solve for was already covered and we had a few more uh, interesting things as well. So here's what I've learned. I think you as a leader are going to communicate the non-negotiable aspects and you are going to also clearly demarcate where you want the team to go crazy. Right? And, and uh, every time we've done that, we have seen phenomenal results because the team is just, I mean, if you if you have a talented team, you you can uh, see what the beautiful things that they come up with, right? And uh, uh, that surprise is worth, uh, you know, all the all the time you invested in them. 
right? Yeah. Because uh, like the um, I, I remember we had uh, published this website called uh, Unveil, right? Unveil dot Unacademy dot com. I think at the end of twenty twenty one, right? It summarized the entire body of work the team had done for the entire year. So we had done this beautiful uh, single scroll website. The team built it in Webflow. Um, the team designed it. Or made animated all the transitions on Webflow, and I think they would have spent around uh, three weeks nonstop working day and night purely on pizza and coke, <laughs> you know. And uh, I had zero involvement, right? And we, I have all I told the team was like, if there was one website that could show how talented you all are and the amount of work you have done, what would you make, <laughs> right? And uh, they came up with the name, they came up with the entire concept, they came up with like the design of it. I was like, I do not want to review. I review your all your projects. Here, I'm not gonna review. Imagine what you would do if there was no constraint. There were no constraints uh, or you know creative uh, uh, direction. Like you set the direction, and uh, they just surprised us. And 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 like it was phenomenal. It got talked about everywhere. I think it even won whatever that award badge and whatnot. I think uh, the team ended up surprising themselves more than everybody else, right? Like, okay, this is what we are cap capable of. And and the, I think that's what it's all about. If the leadership has the confidence that the team is talented and they would figure out the last 20%, they will only be almost opinionated or like stingy about the 80%, right? Like, hey, look, these are the non-negotiable parts. This is where I want things to be a certain way. But I also want the other 20% where you show your magic or let's say the balance could be 50-50 depending on the project. But the point is, if you showcase that as a team, look, we are also talented and we can, you know, like 2x, 3x your idea. Yeah. Like you would start seeing lead more leaders being open to like, okay, out of the 10 details, let me only be very picky about the six. The other four I'm intentionally leaving to the team because I want them to actually show me what else yeah. can be done, right? So... I think you have to arrive there. Uh, you have to arrive at that position where creative lead liberty is is uh, assumed, you know, uh, amongst all the involved parties uh, is because it's proven to bring good results, right? But you you kind of arrive there by showing past results and showing stuff, uh, or even doing projects where that that never were projects, right? Like we just took it upon ourselves, ki let's do this, you know, unveil. Like there was no need. We just wanted to have fun. Was the end of the year, you know, holiday time. We were like, okay, let's build a website, right? Like we have a few people who, who would be able to pull this off and we did. So it, o over uh, those types of projects, you know, mm, I mean, every stage event we have done, like we've done the production design or the videos that we've made, everything has been done in-house. We just had a talented team and like the leadership was every single time, like, wow, did our team internally build this? <laughs> you know, why do we even go to anybody else? Like this is <laughs> such a talented team. So I think uh, now we are in that sweet spot where, where, uh, the team has earned that for themselves. Yeah. I mean, we have to go for a coffee with the team, okay? Because I've been hearing so much <laughs> good things about yeah. them. I'm feeling a little complex now. <laughs> but are they uh, all the most challenging questions again are done? We're good. I want to ask now a couple of quick questions, all right? Like you just have to either reply in a word or in a sentence, sure. maximum, all right. So it starts with, what's that one thing that you feel you haven't learned yet, even after being a leader? The ability to rest well. It came out in your conversation. Oh. What can be imagined can be built. Do you think this is true? Yeah. Why? The only way to build. Okay. If you had to, if you had a chance to do something very different, something very different in your life, okay, and you cannot tell me the startup answer. Sure. Uh, what would you do? I'll make uh, leather wallets. Okay. Why? Yeah. Why? Uh, I love uh, uh, craftsmanship and uh, I have been into just leather goods in general. There are two hobbies that I have is uh, like learning how to make things with leather and uh, watch making. Uh, but watch making is a little far off. So I'll probably come to that later stage in my life. But uh, leather is something that's more accessible. Yeah. Okay, all right. So it can be leather belts as well. Anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. What's that one thing that your team hates you for? <laughs> <laughs> uh, extremely long Figma comments and dad jokes. You, you write essays on Figma as well? Uh, yeah, bullet points, essays. Yeah, whatever needs to uh, be communicated. Yeah. 
and notes by Hardik. You know, <laughs> what is that one thing that you hate about them? Extremely slow slack replies. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In your view, what's the one point of differentiation between a good designer and a great designer? I think uh, the great designer stays on the problem statements. The problem statement uh, one more iteration than the good designer would. Yeah. You're taking the last mile. Yeah. An extra mile. Yeah, yeah. You would probably spend like three more days after any other person would call it's done. Mm. I think a great designer would do that. All right. Uh, what's that one myth in the design industry that you want to debunk here today? That it's possible to be successful as a designer without being really good at designing itself. That's very true. <laughs> That's very true. Okay. Looking back to your design journey, what was that one moment or one thing that was very fulfilling for you? I think building my portfolio was very fulfilling. Uh, I did that right after my stint with Ola ended. Uh, so I was preparing for Google and uh, I, I spent around two months uh, building out a portfolio and I was extremely proud of that. Uh, lessons on YouTube? YouTube. Why? He's worked there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, I, I, I just, I mean, the kind of content I watch, uh, YouTube feels a lot more open, free, and just fun, more fun. Yeah, I, 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 I don't like uh, having to search for things that I don't, that I don't end up finding. You know, like you search for a movie and it's just not there. Yeah, you know, YouTube would give you at least something. So. What yeah. is one advice you give your younger self? Save more money. <laughs> <laughs> Save your money. Like I think uh, sleep better. Uh, yeah, I think uh, my sleep habits have been all over the place since I was in my 10th standards. Yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, an advice that you're giving to yourself now and 20 years back. Is I mean, I better fix it now. Yeah. Should have fixed my younger self should have fixed it, yeah. but he did not. So I I need to do the yeah. do the clean up now. I'm very intrigued. Where where is all your money going into? Shoes <laughs> or watches? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and leather wallets, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I think how he you know, gets a leather wallet. How did they build this? How, how did they build this? Yeah, yeah. Better, <laughs> better uh, yeah, yeah. Take it apart and learn, like, how. No, I think I, I have a few expensive hobbies and I, I, I could uh, slow down on those, is, is what I and my wife both. I think, uh, <laughs> very uh, heavily agree. Yeah. 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 All right. Dark mode or light mode? Light mode. Why? Sees you on the eyes. What? It's a yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a longer conversation. I mean, it's, but but I I find it too. I have it's a no long conversation if you're saying it's easy on the eyes. But I mean, I get it. I use that light mode many times. I'm a, also a light mode person, but you know, you should know. You shouldn't ask for clarification questions. I, you know, it's it's. I have to extend the conversation. You know, sometimes. <laughs> A <laughs> hey, plus podcast hall host we have here. <laughs> light mode, why light mode? Why light mode? Yeah, can you give me three, like ten reasons? Can you give me the ten reasons. Yeah. Ten reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very like, where's the research paper? Yeah, yeah and uh, does that have any impact? Yeah, yeah, yeah on on my yeah, yeah, yeah. on my like uh, you know circadian rhythm and all the, all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still do that. It's 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 a good thing to do. But anyway, uh, one last question, Hardik. Comes from the heart, this one, not fun. What does product design mean to you? It puts uh, food on the table for me and my family. And uh, if I wasn't doing this, I wouldn't have the life that I have now. So I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, It's everything to me. All right, got it. Okay, that being said, thank you so much, Hardik, for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Great answers to everything that I kind of put just right there and yeah thanks for doing this no thanks thanks for having me um i think one uh, one story that i have uh, i think i told uh, dishti was uh, the reason why i said yes was i absolutely loved the message that you had shared i keep getting uh, such requests every now and then a lot of friends are also doing podcasts now and uh, um i usually don't end up doing one is also because uh, the content is more or less the same every time but I think your message clearly showed that you had done your research and, and you really wanted to dabble into some of the, the real topics, right? Like that that would actually shed some light into what life looks like as a design leader. So that's what got me into it. 
that's what got me to say yes. So thanks for sending that out and like putting in the work, you know, up front. It showed and uh, I had a lot of pleasure through the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think uh, I can't wait to see the other episodes and see how you're... But you just said you don't watch episodes, no? I will uh, watch the other episodes for sure. <laughs> I, I, I really want to learn from uh, all the other people you are interviewing. I think the lineup is uh, is spectacular. So uh, looking forward to that. Thanks so much, Ardek. Uh, absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for all the nice comments for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. questions yeah. were great. My questions were great. That means all, all of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Okay.